I knew housing is marketed so much, like a product. It's become this commodification. Mm -hmm. Like you buy a car, this list of features. If you don't fit into those five options, then that's just too bad. Our whole society is no longer structured to allow house building. Trying to do urban homesteading, staking our uh, claim on this little piece of land. We have two quite different visions. Because I think it really puts your relationship through a ringer because there's a lot of uncertainty. Like the principle of two architects putting their ideas together and using them. Suzanne was more focused on the interior, I was more focused on the exterior. I was skeptical at the beginning. Yeah, there's a lot of satisfaction in, you know, huh, I'm right, it really worked. It puts couples under a lot of stress. I didn't actually pick up the phone and call a divorce lawyer. When I leave this place, when I leave this foul place, I will prove you all wrong, you know. So this house is a little bit of a, you know, screw you, we were right. Another thing that's kind of unusual in this house is there's no basement. Part of that is because generally it seems basements just kind of get filled up with, with all the crap. The idea has been to try to live more simply and look at what we're buying, really focus on a few things that we, we really enjoy. Think about it for longevity that it's not going to become something that just gets stored in the basement. By not having a lot of kind of storage area, we're, we're hoping to force ourselves into that. Laneway. It's a different way of thinking. New housing is marketed so much, like a product. And so, you know, you kind of find that, well, I don't want to say repulsive, but you, you know, it kind of pushed us away as opposed to attracting us. Image has is, is become something that's really important in the society. It talks about your status and, and where you are at. The marketing has taken over. It's like marketing a lifestyle. It's, it's just another piece of your lifestyle, like your Nikes or you know what car dri you drive or whatever. The other thing is in, in North America, the image of house has become so narrowed yeah. that it has become this kind of Norman Rockwell-ish image of what a house is supposed to look like. And it's become this commodification mm -hmm. of housing that you're buying, you know, the 2,000 square feet, the two-car garage, mm -hmm. the, the two washrooms per floor, the ensuite washroom. You start to buy like this, like you'd buy a car, this list of features. And I find it really weird in that, that we're, we're kind of creating, um, you have this kind of Victorian, faux Victorian exterior, yet it's simply just a wrapper that we're putting on. It's just simply an image. Housing has become very specific niche market, you know? And, and if, it's, if you don't fit into those five options, then that's just too bad. You have to make do. The primary uh, kind of design intent, I guess, of the house is, is to recreate a courtyard house, although modify to, to fit into the Canadian context as far as, you know, just the heat and the cold. So we've created this kind of indoor-outdoor courtyard space. The other thing that is, is being on an alleyway is you want it to, to enclose the space to a certain extent. So right across, which you can't see right here, but roughly where those line of concrete blocks is, there'll be a one-story garage that will kind of enclose the space so that you know we're creating kind of an inner sanctum. The, the indoor section continues on into the house and it's expressed as a two-story high space that's separated from the outside by the uh, two stories of glass. This is all south facing, so the screening blocks the summer sun and allows the winter sun in. Primarily our heat is, is from the passive solar, so we need to get as much sun as possible in during the, uh, the winter months so that it's heating up all the, the heavy elements, all the concrete here. So it acts as a flywheel, it gets heated up during the day and then releases the heat at night. So it has two functions, one it reduces the temperature inside during the day 
because it's absorbing all that heat and, and at night it's releasing its heat so it's warming up the space. Kitchen is uh, on this side so it's uh, located just off the, the big two-story space so it becomes a central focus, the kind of heart of the house. See what's going on upstairs from the kitchen and vice versa which again has uh, an opening out onto a deck, whole idea of being indoor outdoor. So the whole house expands in the summer and then it kind of compresses in the winter and you know, kind of like you get cozy in the winter. So the house does the same thing. And then the kitchen itself, like it's just built out of uh, reused metal shelving that we got from a, a scrap yard and plywood that was left over from the exterior. So again, we've tried to just, you know, make reuse uh, one of the key, key elements of the house. You know, reduce, reuse, recycle. So, you know, we're trying to reduce space by being as small as possible, and expanding that in the summer. We reuse a lot of material and then the, the house itself is designed to be recycled or reused. Um, you notice a lot of the materials are not typical of what you'd find in uh, residential construction. Concrete block, the steel, the steel deck. But when this house is no longer used either as a residence, it's very flexible because of the large spans. They're, the only load-bearing walls are the, the concrete block walls on, on either side, so it's very flexible. It could be used as an office or turned back into a warehouse type space or whatever else. And then even at that point, when the building's finally done its life, you can actually take it all apart, you can reuse the steel beams, so the whole house can be deconstructed in a way that it can be easily recycled. She was that kind of, she was that kind of uh, kid. She would do whatever she wanted to do, she would say whatever she wanted to say. And uh, so by uh, Christmas time, we got our first report card and uh, for Susan. So we look at it, there was one sentence saying there, Susan doesn't want to do what she was told to do, period. In other words, she just do whatever she wanted to do. Doesn't matter whether it was the teacher who was telling her or anybody else. And I s said to myself and said to my wife, I said, isn't that true? <laughs> it, it's not news to me. <laughs> I could have written that report myself. <laughs> At that time, I was worried. You know, I mean, she doesn't want to listen to anybody. She, Gee, what I'm going to do? She's going to be kicked out of school. Problem kid. But she turned out okay. It was okay. He's always been interested in the way the city's been laid out. His whole bedroom, when he was small, was a city. He had little tiny street signs taped on toothpicks all over, and his, uh, his, his carpet at that time was a whole bunch of squares that we had stuck on a piece of, of carpet. So he made those into parks and streets, and he put houses on the corners. You couldn't walk there safely, but it was all very carefully planned out. I'm glad that my kids would be born here and brought up here rather in Hong Kong because her philosophy about life and doing things would be completely different. And she won't be building a house like this. Probably she will be running around making money <laughs> rather than building a house like this. <laughs> when we first decided to do this, I didn't really tell my parents because my dad can be pretty conservative about stuff like that. I thought you'd freak out. And when I eventually told him, he said, wow, why don't you just put up two houses, do semis, and then you can sell one and live in the other. But that's not the point, Dad. The, dad, the, the point is to build what we want. It's not to, like, here's a cheap piece of land and we can turn a profit. We're trying to turn away from that, from the commodity. We're trying to do urban homesteading, you know, staking our uh, claim on this little piece of land. The financing? Angel investor. <laughs> Otherwise, bank of mom and dad. We were very lucky in that, that my mother believed enough in us to basically put her house on the line so that we could get a secured line of credit. Uh, otherwise, it would have been very difficult. Like, yeah. Our whole society is no longer structured to allow house building. Basically, what we have to do, the other way of doing it is what they call builder's mortgage, where they will lend you the value of the piece of land. Which in our case wasn't much. Which wasn't much yeah. uh, compared to the construction yeah. costs. So you kind of, you know, kind of stymied in a way. Unless you've got some access to funds other than, you know, through a bank, well, who's, you know, you're Mr. and Mrs. Joe Average or Mr. and Mr. Joe Average, and you go to the bank and say, listen, you don't have this piece of land, I need, please lend me $300,000 so I can build it. Well, who the heck's going to give you that money? But if you say, 
I want to buy this thing that has, you know, the attached garage, air conditioning, finished basement. Oh, here you go, have 500,000. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult. The background they'd be, they both had, the commitment they'd both shown. I can remember Suzanne have, coming um, to our house when, when they weren't married with a project about how to make a, a very low impact cottage. And the commitment she showed trying to figure out all the, the details for something that would use very little water or power. Their training has had a, a strong focus on how to leave no footprints when they build. Well, I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to start finding ways to use less room, use less energy, and still keep ourselves comfortable. I, I'm hoping it will be one of the things that saves the planet in the long run. So this is the uh, second floor. The, the usages up here will be more the, the family usages, the private usage. So we have what will be a bedroom right now. It's our makeshift workshop. We have a washroom over here. And we have a bedroom that will be on the other side and a small hobby room. You can see it looks pretty rough, like it's kind of unfinished. But one of the first things we, we approached it was from an environmental point of view, we just wanted to keep things really simple and not develop this really elaborate theory. So we just kind of stayed with reduce, reuse, recycle. So one of the first things was reducing the finishes. Did you really need, you know, drywall on top of the concrete block or could you just leave the concrete block? Same thing with the steel beams and the, the steel roof. This is the uh, bridge element that we've put across the, the open space. It's primarily just to connect the two spaces, but we wanted to keep it something light. So the primary structure is the, the steel. The steel uprights were, were salvaged from a, uh, a scrap yard. And then the, the wood is, is the beach, both in the handrails and on the, the floor deck. It's very durable. It's something that will last for a very long time. It's, it's very difficult to actually get sustainably harvest wood, so we don't have that, but it's a, a relatively fast growing wood and it's relatively available. So it's, it's as good as we could do. Well, funnily enough, one of the major points of departure, I don't know if Peter talked about it, was his late uncle Russell. And his late uncle Russell was in the computer programming business. He made his money and he cashed out and he became a potter. And he traveled the world. And he lived in our apartment for a while while we were in South Africa. And when we came back, he'd left all sorts of artifacts, you know, all over the place because he was not living in a permanent residence. So he just kind of left stuff around. And we, we used to joke with Russell that, hey, we should buy a house together. And, you know, the three of us should build some kind of a compound and there'd be like a studio in the middle so that we'd have this creative lifestyle. And Russell passed away really suddenly and unexpectedly. And I remember looking at Peter and we, we were looking at each other and we thought, you know, life's too short. You shouldn't wait to do things. There's no proper time for stuff. If you want to do it, just do it. So I think that was a real first push because all the way through school we talked about, oh, someday we should do our own house. Oh, wouldn't it be cool? And you know what? When Russell passed away, we thought there is no right time. Life's too short. Just, just go for it. So I think that on a personal note, that was one of the things that pushed us. So this is the, uh, the third floor. What we have here is the, uh, the bedroom. And uh, behind we have a walk-in closet and what will eventually be the, uh, the washroom. So the master bedroom gets, as, as all the other bedrooms do, an outdoor space, which in this case is the, uh, the walk-out deck. We've, and uh, again, the, uh, the outside will have a metal screen that's going around to kind of edit the view. So we're not really looking into people's backyards, but we're really looking into the trees of, of the neighborhood. And uh, in the winter, when the leaves fall away, you're kind of looking at the rooftops, almost like a, a skyline view. Uh, of, of the neighborhood. You know, green roofs are such, uh, especially in an urban area, we're lucky that we have a fairly large site, but where you have a smaller site, uh, you know, it just, it's kind of a no-brainer. You get this great, you know, green space that, that you can use. Plants uh, shield the roof from the sun, so it, it provides some cooling, it retains water, so uh, you don't have this storm surge of water coming down. And in the winter, the soil and the plants themselves uh, provide additional insulation. For so long, we've just kind of covered our, our roofs with black tar and forgot about it.
It's, it's been very difficult. Um, I, I won't pull any punches. It really puts your relationship through a ringer because there's a lot of uncertainty. We have two quite different visions and it hasn't stopped. Like, to a certain extent, once certain moves were made, the house started to dictate what it wanted to be. It's quite definitely a combination. And in that sense, it feels a lot like a child. Sometimes you look at it and you go, what is it doing? Oh, you know, it has Suzanne's eyes or, you know, it has my feet or something. Why is it doing that? Well, I guess it kind of works and that's how it wants to be. And we talk about the house a lot in that way. It wants to do this. And like, no, I don't think it would be comfortable with that. So you have to let it go. It takes a bit of its own life, I think. It, it hasn't been easy. It's never been an easy process. And it puts couples under a lot of stress. I knew uh, an older contractor who did a lot of renovations. The first thing he said was, well, you know, the story, the success story in a renovation or construction is if I see kids, right? If they're still married and they have kids, then it's a success story. His theory has always been that it's probably one of the biggest tests for a marriage. Um, that, you know, either it's going to, like, you know, that's it, you know, you're going to see all the things you see differently and it just highlights how you're different as individuals and you're not going to learn how to negotiate that or you see the similarities and you learn how to negotiate with the, uh, you, know, you know, the oppositions and you actually become stronger as a couple. Biggest fight or the most recent fight? Because the most recent always seems like the biggest. Like we designed together by arguing. So, you know, the arguments are integral and every major design decision came as a result of a vigorous debate. One of the, the things was um, what we wanted people to think about the house. Yeah, if, what, if somebody came and saw the house for the first time, what would be the what? comment we would like to hear? Yeah, and I think number one was, what were they thinking? <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> That's true.